Easily. So good to be back in, uh, it's not technically Lismore, is it? No. It's Ganalabar, is that right? So good to be back here, so good to see what God's doing. How many believe that He can uh, change a city, yeah. change a nation? We are as a movement, you probably know this through your pastors, as a movement of churches, an international network of churches. We are 50 years old this year. In uh, two weeks, three weeks, we have our, our conference in Brisbane and we just believe in God for just an outpouring of His Spirit over us. Hey, and, I, I, and, and not just because it's our 50th, I've been travelling around the nation a fair bit. In recent months, I've been travelling, doing uh, a bunch of prayer gatherings around our nation in, uh, in regions. And I've got to say, there's an expectation over our nation that God is going to do something sovereign. That, how many know we need it? How many know that all the efforts of man aren't really working? But how many know there's a God that loves us so much, he's likely to pour out his spirit and arrest us arrest the hearts of the church and arrest the hearts of a nation and turn them back to him. So if you're praying, please be praying that God would revive this nation and all nations of the earth. If he can revive me, he can revive you. Amen. So it's just such an exciting time to be alive. You know, the Bible says where, uh, where evil abounds, grace abounds even more. And as, as dark as it may look, I believe there's coming a a move of the light of God over our nation just to do something profound. Amen? Amen. And as I reminded the men last night, the Tigers may have won, but Queensland is still up 1-0. All right, okay. So, okay, I've got some righteous folk in the building this morning. I'm really a rugby union man, but I don't talk about that too much because we're not doing so well. Hey, uh, how many know when uh, Alan just was up here this morning and he started to talk about the, the, where we go uh, when things are going wrong. You know, our propensity is to go to the things of the natural, hey? But he reminded us of something that we need, that our battle is not in the natural, our battle is not in the carnal, our battle is in the realms of heaven. How many people knew that? It's amazing how, many we, how, how much we know these things, but we, don't need, we need to be reminded of these things. I think over and over again, my walk with Jesus is not so much about learning new things, but about being reminded of foundational things. And this morning, I've just felt to go away about, uh, uh, the, the, not to go away, to go in a direction that just again lays some foundations of what our faith is all about. Because I find if the foundation's not right, the building's not right. If I find if I don't go deep, it doesn't matter, matter how high I go, it's going to get blown over. Jesus even said this, and these up, this slide's not up there in the book of Matthew. I woke up early this morning. I'm one of these people that just keep adding to things, you know. But Jesus said this about, about uh, building our life. He said, when the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Jesus just laying a, 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 a principle that it's so important what we build our lives on. Even the Apostle Paul over and over, again, in the book of Ephesians that Alan referred to this morning, he, 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 he prays that we would not be a people that are tossed to and fro, fro by every wind. Wind of doctrine, wind of turmoil, wind of whatever it might be. His prayer is that the people of God are built on foundations which do not move. And I don't know about you, but I find sometimes I need to be reminded of these foundations. If my foundation's not right, the rest doesn't matter. I was thinking about an illustration and um, I'm going to put a, 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 my slides up there or not. Yeah, they are. I'm going to put a, uh, a photo up there in a minute, but let me explain the context of having a right foundation, having stability, right? A week ago, for those of you that don't know, I paddle ocean skis, and a week ago, I went in a race up on the Sunshine Coast, and being the competitor, I shouldn't call it a race, it's an event, because at my age, I'm looking after the rear of the field more than the front of the field, but nonetheless, I still got this thing in me, right? And so... We, we're in this, this, this race and 
We're a, it, take, it took about an hour and three quarters, right? And so we're doing this race and I pulled up at the beach. Now, why they do this, I don't know. I'm going to speak to the officials because they make you run. At the end of a paddle race, they make you run, right? So I pull up on the beach at the same time as another guy about my age. And we had a race three weeks earlier and I beat him. And we pull into the beach at the same time. And I think, I am going to beat him. I've got to get to the finish line. So out of the ski, I jump and I start to run up the beach, forgetting to get my foundation right, to get my stability right, to take my body from using its upper uh, limbs to its lower limbs. And this was the result just before the finish line. Is it there? Is there? <laughs> now see that coot behind me? He ran straight past me. Because my foundation was wobbling everywhere. And I'm thinking, I'm just going to run and forget about the foundation. And where did I end up? Flat on my face. I sent my wife the photo. She said, oops. By the way, I was right at the end of the field too, so that there was everybody around after that finish line having a look. There were people ready to roll out wheelchairs and God knows what not for me. How many know it's important to have the foundation right? And I want to talk to you about some things of our foundation today. I want to talk to you about the rock of our righteousness. The rock of our righteousness. And we're going to go to the book of Romans chapter 1. And I'm just going to work through this passage of Scripture because hopefully you'll find some, some life-changing and enlightening aspects to what we've got to share. Paul writes to the church in Rome. Let me just, let me just emphasize that. Paul writes to the church in Rome. He's not writing to the city of Rome. He's writing to the church in Rome. And he says first, I thank God through Jesus Christ. I feel like I'm writing to the church in Ganalabar. First, I thank God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you uh, always in my prayers, making request that if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. Say established. The whole point of Paul's letter the whole point of all of Paul's letters and the point of Paul wanting to visit the churches is that he can establish them in truth and lay a foundation for them that never moves. He's, and he's writing to the church and he says, wouldn't it be a great thing if every time we came together, we would look to establish other people? Paul says, I want to come to you that you may, to impart a spiritual gift that you may be established. And then he goes on to say, that is that I may be encouraged together with you. I just think that's awesome, eh? You know, you know people, I, 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 we shouldn't need to convince people to come to church. I think coming to church gives me the opportunity to be established and then to establish others and to impart spiritual gifts to others so that we can all be encouraged. Wouldn't you like to go away from church every week to be by being encouraged and more established? And it says that you may be so encouraged together with you by mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often plan to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I'm a debtor, both to Greeks and barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Some translations say, I am eager to preach the gospel to you. I come to Lismore, eager 
to preach the gospel to you. Paul says, I want to come to Rome and I'm eager to preach the good news to you. Let me just put this into some sort of context. Isn't he already talking to the church? Why does the church need the gospel preached? Wouldn't we think it's the world that needs the gospel preached? Paul's already said in the first couple of verses that their faith is celebrated throughout the whole earth. And yet Paul still says, I'm eager to come and preach this gospel to you again. How many people know we need the gospel preached to us every day? We need the gospel preached to us over and over again. We don't, Paul, it seems like he's building or he's going over what they already know. But I think that is precisely the point. We need to go over and over and over again the good news of Jesus Christ in our life every day. Because I find I move away from it. I find I become self-reliant. I find, like Alan was saying this morning, in the midst of battles, I reach into other things other than the truth because I momentarily forget that which is good news. Who's with me today? It's only Queenslanders that struggle with this. It's only Queenslanders that, 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 that forget how good this good news is and how relevant this good news is Every day of my life, I have a look and I think, geez, what's Paul talking about? He even says, I'm indebted. I'm obliged. I've got to come. I've got to come to Lismore and I've got to fix up your doctrine. <laughs> I'm joking. I've got to come and I've got to share again this good news. Why is he doing that? Because the church, because us as individuals, Move away from the rocks of the foundations that we have in Christ Jesus. I'm all for learning. I'm all for theological know-how. But if I ever move past the basic rock solid truths that are found in the good news themselves. And the reason Paul writes to the churches, every one of his epistles really say the same thing. He's coming back and he corrects the churches that get off track because they've added things to the good news. They've forgotten the good news. They've forgotten who they are in Christ. And Paul is always coming back and almost saying, don't you remember? Don't you remember? I am here to remind you. How many know the people outside need the gospel? How many know that people outside need the gospel? But also, Paul is, how many know that people inside need the gospel every day as well? Maybe today you need the gospel. Tim Keller says this, the gospel is the way people are called to faith and it's the way people grow in faith. Sometimes we want to go past the foundations, but I want to encourage us this morning, challenge us this morning, never to go past the foundation. Because if you forget the foundation, everything will be like me in the sand, on my face, trying to crawl across the finish line in my own strength. Listen to Paul. I asked Jackie what time to go till today, and she said a very dangerous thing. As long as I like. I promise I won't do that. He goes on and he says, Paul says, I want to I wanna go over, I wanna, I wanna, I'm eager to preach this gospel. In other words, I'm eager for you to remember the gospel. This morning, I'm, either, I'm eager for you to, I'm not likely to share anything new with you this morning. I'm, I'm eager to remind you of the gospel. I'm eager to remind you of who you are. I'm eager to remind you of all that we sang about this morning, the power in the name of Jesus, the healing in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus being the foundation of all things. Paul actually says when he writes to the Corinthian church, I've been very careful, he says to the church at Corinth, to lay a foundation. And there is no other foundation other than Jesus Christ. You can't add anything. It's not Jesus plus, it's Jesus is everything. We don't add to Jesus. We build on the foundation. But Jesus and all he has done for us on that cross, was Owen, wasn't it? Shared the gospel, shared the communion with us this morning. How wonderful, how great thou art. I'm not, I'm not far behind him going to glory. But just to remind ourselves of the mystery 
and the greatness of all he's done for us. For Paul says, why am I eager? Because he says in verse 16, and some of you here last night might remember that Alan actually shared this verse uh, at the beginning of the meeting. But Paul goes on, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In other words, I'm not ashamed to come and bring this to you over and over and over again. I'm going to keep speaking this gospel over and over again. Why am I not ashamed? Because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Do we have any believers here this morning? It is the power of God. The gospel, the good news is the power. I've I've determined this about the gospel. It's a silly story or it's the power of God. You decide. God becomes a baby, born in a manger, grows up, doesn't sin, dies on a cross, I'm forgiven. That is either one of two things. It is either a silly fable or it's the power of God. I believe it's the power of God and I'm willing to base or stack my eternity on the fact that it's the power of God to save my soul, to bring righteousness to my life, to set me free. Amen. So Paul says this, it's the power of God under salvation for just the people in the front row. No, it's the power of God under salvation for everyone who believes. First the Jew and also the Greek, for, it is in, for in it it's the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. What does it mean to be ashamed of the gospel? Another word for shame that Paul uses here, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, he, it, it could be equally translated, I am not offended by the gospel. How many know, even to the church in Corinth again, Paul says that the, doc, the, the, the gospel, the good news story of Jesus Christ is offensive, to the, it's a stumbling block to the Jews and it's offensive to the Gentiles. It's offensive. Why would people be offended by the gospel? I wonder. There's a few reasons. There's a few reasons why I might be offended by the gospel. Because the gospel tells me that inside of me, there is no hope for salvation if it's not through Jesus Christ alone. The gospel offends me because it tells me, it reminds me that in me nothing good dwells. Now I know you all think I'm a saint. I know that you all think that I'm nearing perfection. But I want to tell you something, nearing is not good enough. And the gospel, what are you laughing at? My goodness. The gospel is offensive to me because it reminds me There is no self in salvation. It doesn't matter how good I am, how polished I am, how how I compare to other people. The gospel's offensive because in me there is nothing that deserves salvation. I've got to rely. Doesn't that go against my, my, my my own pride? That I need to seek salvation outside of myself for thousands of years and it still goes on, mankind and I was going to say potentially, but I'll say frequently, we find in the church people still trying to bring salvation to themselves by their own works. Still living out of law, of right. You know, the problem, I love the right side of living by the law. It's the wrong side that gets me, gets me in trouble. But, but the gospel's offensive to me first and foremost because it says, Gary, <laughs> this has got nothing to do with you. To, to the flesh... Even to my saved flesh, sometimes that's offensive. Yeah? Just me. Just Queenslanders. Just Queenslanders. The gospel could be offensive to me because it tells me that nothing but the death 
of the Son of God could make me right. I was that far gone that it took the death of Jesus Christ. Not 35 years ago when I got saved. Today, I can be that far gone that it still took the death of Jesus Christ to die on a cross to make me right with him. Uh, I can be offended because it can tell me all the good I try to do will never be good enough to earn my salvation. That can be offensive to me. And Paul's writing to the church and he's laying the foundations of Christian doctrine and he's saying to the church that the gospel is offensive not only to the world but sometimes to those in the church because we're building on another foundation. We're building on the foundation of self. I'm going somewhere with this today. But the foundation of self is going to end up with you in the sand face down. Because it's going, it doesn't matter how good you are, that's where it's going to end up. Paul then goes on and he talks about, because this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why am I not ashamed? Because number one, it's the power of God. I have got no idea. I have got no idea how 38, 39 years ago, no idea what turned my heart. What turned, other than my wife asking pastors over to my house? I have no idea what got in here that turned my life around. I still can't explain it in, in natural terms. Something in this message of good news, Jesus turned up with his power and took my sin and turned me around and saved me. Paul says it is the, it's, it doesn't have a power, it is the power. Maybe you're in this place this morning and you've not experienced that power. He is here today to turn your heart. Don't try to turn your own heart. Just release it to him and let the power of God take you from the kingdom of darkness and plant you firmly into the kingdom of the love of his son. That's the power of the gospel. Church, do you remember the day? Do you re I'll never forget that day. Never forget the day that the power of God. But here's where I'm going this morning. That power is needed again today. It's needed in my life today. I need to remind myself that the gospel, it wasn't good news 39 years ago. It was good news this morning. I got out of bed. I didn't sin at all today until I woke up. And then there was probably something even wrong before that. But today I can remember that the good news of Jesus Christ is the power of God to save me, to forgive me, to release me, to set me free. How many can remember it? i got to tell you, religion will kill you because religion's about what you've got to do. The message of the gospel is about what Jesus did. And that's what I'm here to remind you of this morning. It's, as I said, as I've already said, it's the power of God to do what? It's the power of God to save. And it's the power of God to save to who? Everyone who believes. Everyone. Who believes? How many believe this morning that the power of God is towards you who believe this morning? You know, this changes, and I'll get there in a few minutes. If, if I understand this, it changes everything. Owen and Alan this morning talked about coming and doing battle in the spirit realm. Talked about coming and bringing our requests to God. Coming and, and what I forget the phrase you used, but it was something like, why don't we pray first? You know, if I don't know this, if I'm not secure in this foundation, my prayer life gets affected. Because I don't know the foundation on which to approach God. If I'm approaching God on my works and myself, I've got no confidence that he may answer me or not. I need a foundation that, that, that is outside of me. 
that I can come to God with confidence. How dare we come and ask him to do anything for us? Yes, how dare us in our own self, but he has made me right with himself. He has given me the foundation. I can boldly come before his throne. I can take authority over principalities and powers. I can believe him for miracles, all because of the foundation. And if the foundation's not right, the rest of it, I'm inconsistent. I'm doubting. I'm all over the place. I'm tossed to and fro. Does God like my prayers today because I've been good? Or is he a bit off me today? And does it, I'll just leave that one and I'll park it. It's the power of God to everyone who believes. And he goes on. And he says in verse 17, I'm not, I'm not offended. It's the power of God. Why is it the power of God? For in it, in the message, in the good news, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Anybody ever heard of a guy by the name of Martin Luther? Had a little bit to do with our Protestant beginnings, didn't he? It is said that Martin Luther, in his pursuit of God, started to hate God because of the phrase in this verse, the righteousness of God. He felt it was a completely unfair statement. He was a religious man. He was a godly man. He was in pursuit, a serious pursuit of the things of God. But he came across this this. I guess, phrase or this standard in the Bible called the righteousness of God. Now, I don't want to undermine or underemphasize how holy that righteousness is. This was where Martin Luther's struggle was. He had a revelation of the magnificent holiness, the perfection, the righteous perfection of God. And he started to believe this is not fair because as serious as I am in my pursuit of God's righteousness, all I ever realize is how far short I fall. I can never make it. I can never get there. It's impossible. It's unfair. And he began to resent God for the phrase, for the term, until it was, and it says in verse 17, it was revealed to him that this righteousness was not something he had to attain but something he should receive. It was a righteousness not of himself that can only be received not by how good you are, Paul, as good as you are. It is a righteousness that can only be received. And all of a sudden, the lights came on for Martin Luther. The Protestant Revolution was began simply because there was a revealing, a revelation that in this gospel, you and I no longer have to struggle for the righteousness of God. Sure, we need to pursue righteousness, but we never have to struggle for, for the righteousness of God. It is given to me by faith. I don't know if you're happy about that this morning, but I, my wife is certainly happy that God has given me righteousness. Who's with me? You're not very excited about this this morning. I mean, I mean, I got to say, every time I read this, I think this is just so brilliant. 
It's a righteousness. What does the word righteous? Let me put it another way. The word righteousness, another way of saying it would be right standing. If Alan and I, despite the border, it's a big one. If we are in right standing with each other, that means there is no liability between us. I can come to L, he can come to me. There's nothing separate, there's no lie, there's Sam, isn't it? Nothing standing between you and God, man. I know you've been perfect this week, but, but the, the bad weeks, there's nothing standing. I, I, if I'm in right standing with the police, that means they got nothing against me. They can't come to, at me. If I'm in right standing with the government, then the government's got nothing on me, right? There's no lie. If I am in right, think about it. If I'm in right standing with God, whoo, there is no liability. There is nothing standing between me and him. He has, he has put it away on the cross. He has taken the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and he has, he's, he's put all of my unrighteousness on him and he's given me all of his righteousness. And now, oh, how does that affect your prayer life when you know there's no liability between you and God? I can come boldly into the throne of God. I can come praising. I can come asking. I can come full of, full of confidence because I know there's nothing between me and him. And yet I live my life as if there was. I still measure up how good I was yesterday or how good I'll be tomorrow and maybe I'll be a little bit more deserving. Maybe God will be a bit more pleased with me. There is nothing that can make God more pleased with me. I can, out of this receiving him, I can do my best to be the living sacrifice, to live a life worthy of him. Paul and all the other writers of the, of, of, of the, of the Bible in, uh, encourage us to do this, to walk worthy. But we walk worthy not to be worthy. We walk worthy because we are worthy. And we want to give him a return for all he's done. Are you with me today? There's people here that just need, I need, the reason I'm sharing this is as much for me as you, but to help us again to go back to what Paul says to the church in Rome. It's almost like he's saying, I know you know this stuff, but I want to go over it again. I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to know, don't be offended by this message. This message will offend the moralistic people of the world. This message will offend those people that are trying to make it on their own. This message will offend the licentious people of the world who believe there is no need for God. It will, it will offend the religious people of this world who are trying to work their way to God. It will offend them. But for you and I, there's no reason to be offended because we've been given this right standing. Listen to verse 17 in, I've got a... The, the Passion Translation. This gospel unveils a continual revelation of God's righteousness. A perfect righteousness given to us when we believe. That offends me. Surely I've got to do something. Surely. You know, this, 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 this thing in me that wants to... At least give me some credit. No, 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 Gary, you get no credit. All the credit goes to him. <laughs> Given to me. And it moves us from receiving life through faith 39 years ago to the power of living by faith. This is what the scripture means when it says you are right with God through the life-giving faith. You see, you don't receive your righteousness when you get saved and then build a life in your own strength. You receive your righteousness every day and out of that revelation, you walk and live a life by faith, pleasing to God to the best of your ability. And what happens when you fall over? He picks you up because your righteousness isn't affected. Right, if, I, if, if Al and I are in right standing and he does something like wins a state of origin game and I get offended, then we've got to fix it up, right? We've got to get it right. We've got to repair it. 
I don't have to repair anything with God. Because Jesus Christ, once and for all, paid the price of my unrighteousness and gave me... How many, how many, how many think it's good to be forgiven? But I, I just, I just, I'll, I'll close in an hour or two. <laughs> Righteousness is more than forgiveness. Forgiveness is to be pardoned. If they sentenced me to prison and, and Joe Biden comes and pardons me, they let me out. And my past sins are no more. I am pardoned. But then I'm left to myself to build a new life. To be given righteousness is not just to be pardoned. It's not just to have your past forgiven. It's to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why last night when I was speaking to the men about looking in the mirror, what do you see? See, we see the sinner. God sees the prodigal clothed in the robes of righteousness of his father. I haven't just been forgiven by what Jesus did. I have been given his righteousness. And because I'm clothed with the power of his righteousness, I can live the life of a son because that's who I am in his eyes. I hope this is helping you this morning because it is helping me. It is helping me preach it, I tell you, because as if, if I know I'm clothed. The prodigal, he didn't just get the, he didn't just come back to be a servant in his father's house. He got clothed with all of the dignity of his father's house. He was free to roam his father's house. He was free to walk in the authority of his father's house. He was free to go to his father in and out as he would. And you and I have that privilege. When I pray, I don't pray because I'm good. I pray because I'm righteous. And I'm righteous because he gave me that righteousness. And all I've got to do is to believe it. If I don't believe it, verse 18, and I'm going to finish, the musicians can come. Verse 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. If I don't have, it is a serious issue not to have the righteousness of God. It is an eternity without God not to have the righteousness of God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. How many know it's serious not to be righteous? But Paul's reminding the church at Rome that it's possible to be unrighteous in the church as well as outside the church. Because if I'm trying to get my own righteousness, I'm as unrighteous as anybody. I receive righteousness by faith, by believing, by believing, by believing. I got a little summary, three statements. I think it's on the slides up there. God's demands are be righteous. God's diagnosis is nobody's righteous. God's deliverance is Jesus, is our righteousness. And today, I want you to stand with me. Tim Keller wrote this. He said, the gospel only sounds good to those who know they're bad. If I think I'm good, I've lost it. When I know I'm lost, I'm found. So paradoxical. Someone else I read said I'm the worst sinner I know. And that's not downgrading myself and it's not trying to, not trying to excuse being a sinner. But what it's saying is I need to, Paul is telling us today, church, remember the gospel. I'm eager to preach the gospel. I'm eager, church in Rome, that you would be reminded of what your standing is. I'm eager that you recall to account every day. 
Do you remember it right now? The, the, the day that the righteousness of God was revealed to you? The, the language of Paul is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. It's not, a revel, it's not something that you can find in the natural ways. It's something that's revealed to you from heaven. You know how special you are? That God would reveal to you from heaven that He's given you His righteousness. He's imparted it to you. That's the, the power of the Holy Spirit in your world right now. Why don't you close your eyes with me right now? Right now, whatever's happened in your week, in your week, month, years, or wherever you are today, I want you to recall. Come on, I want you to recall right now. Paul says, I'm coming to remind you, church at Rome, I'm coming to preach to you again the good news that you may have heard years ago. Arise, I'm here to, to, to remind you of the gospel that some of you have known for decades upon decades, but, but let it be fresh to you today. Let it be a reminder of you today that the gift of righteousness is yours, that the confidence you have before heaven is yours because of what Jesus, and if you'll just believe again today, I believe it's going to change the way you pray. It's going to change the way you walk. It's even going to give you victory over the things of the flesh because you're learning to walk in His righteousness and not in your own. Father, in the name of Jesus, Alan led us in things we need to pray for. Why don't you do that again right now? The things that you were praying for or believing for before, the realms of darkness that you were taking authority over before, why don't we do it again right now? But why don't we do it from a position of remembering how righteous we are? We are, we have, there is no liability between you and God. You come in through the veil by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're accepted in the throne room of God. You have every right to be there, not because you're great, but because He has given you His greatness. Would that change the way you pray, church? Would that change the way you believe, church? Come on, reach out to Him right now. Oh, Father. Oh, Father, right now we come in the name of Jesus. We come boldly into the throne of God right now. We thank You that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We thank You, Lord, that just by our faith, the faith of a mustard seed, we can believe today. We can believe today that You've clothed us in Your righteousness. Oh, Father. Oh, Father, for some of you right now, I just believe there was a, a moment when I started to talk about being clothed. Some of you have known that you've been forgiven. That's only half the story. Right now, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit wants you. Oh, Jesus, help us right now. You know, the prodigal son found it difficult to accept that he could be clothed. He maybe thought he could be forgiven, but he found it difficult to believe he could be clothed again in the royalty of the Father. And some of you have struggled with that. And right now, I just sense across this room, the Holy Spirit is coming alongside you. And He wants you to allow Him to put that cloak on you, to clothe you. But Gary, you don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. If by faith you receive your salvation in Jesus Christ, He wants to clothe you this morning. The problem is, and the problem as to why Christians walk in shame of their past, is they fail to allow God to clothe them in His righteousness. They may accept that they're forgiven, but they walk around like a person released from prison, not knowing where to go next. Whereas today, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit in this place is coming and He's clothing you again. Oh, Father, there's so much freedom here. There's so, if, that, if that's you today, Terry and I and Alan, Jackie would love to pray with you. Just, just as we stand with you and just we see, 
I just see in my spirit, God, you know you've had difficulty with this. I'm not here just to have altar calls for the sake of it. But if you know that you've, you've struggled, you, you struggle to see yourself clothed in perfection. I want you to come and allow the Holy Spirit to put that upon you this morning. Maybe you're here today and you, you don't know this gospel. You've not heard it before. You don't know there's good news. You, know, you, know, you haven't heard that you do not have to be perfect to be saved. In fact, you can be saved totally so far from perfection because Jesus Christ became your sin for you. Jesus Christ died on the cross in your place. Not only that you would be forgiven, but that you would be accepted in heaven as a son or daughter of God. If you've not heard that good news this morning, I'm eager to preach it to you. I'm eager to tell you about it. Don't leave this place. Do not leave this place without coming and seeing myself or one of the pastors here that we may be able to explain. We may be able to pray. We may be able to introduce you to Jesus Christ. But just before I close, I said before, righteousness of God is revealed. Can I just have every person praying this morning? Father, By the power of your Spirit, would you reveal, would you reveal yourself to every person here in greater measure? Would you reveal righteousness? For those that may not know you, Holy Spirit, if you don't know Christ, I believe the Holy Spirit is revealing something to you, not to your mind, but to your spirit. You're saying, Gary, could this be true? Could this good news be that God would accept me, love me, give me his righteousness? Could this be true? Let the Holy Spirit, I trust him with your life today. Let him reveal to you. For others in the church that you know, like like Paul wrote to the Romans, you know that you've been doing it in your own strength. Father God, by the power of your spirit, would you reveal to every one of us today how righteous we are. In Jesus' mighty name. I'm going to hand back to your pastor right now. We can close the service or do what he wants. But if you need prayer, if you believe God, if you know that the Holy Spirit wants you to allow him to clothe you, please come and let us lay hands on you this morning. Because I just believe this will change your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. Hey, I want to challenge you like I challenged the men last night. Uh, the Bible tells us very clearly, God gives, God opposes the proud, but he gives great grace to the humble. And you could be sitting here this morning and you know God's speaking to you, but there's a voice in your head going, yeah, but you know, maybe I can, I'll just wait till I get home and I'll sit with God and me and him will deal with it. Or, you know, m- m- maybe if I walk forward, what will people think? You know, are they going to think I think I'm not saved? Are they going to think this? Are they going to think that? C- can I just tell you from my own experience, God... When God deals with me, He determines this, the time, He de- determines the place, and He determines the way. And all I do is respond to Him. And when I respond to God in humility, when I respond to God in humility, there's something released in those moments. God gives grace to the humble. And grace is not just some ethereal woo feeling. Paul says, I am who I am because of the grace of God. In other words, the grace of God is what has changed me and made me into this person that I am now. When we encounter the grace of God, when we humble ourselves, that grace that's released is the power of God. And if God's speaking to you this morning about something, that's because He's decided right now, today, this is the moment where I want to pull you out. This is that moment where I want to talk to you and reveal and show you and speak to you and deal with maybe that thing in your life. So if that's you this morning, God's been speaking to you. I'm going to encourage you. Get out of your chair, come forward and receive prayer. Humble yourself before God. Work with the Holy Spirit. This is how we grow in our faith. This is how God takes us forward on this journey. We cooperate and work with Him. He says now, we say, okay. Okay. And if you're here this morning, we all know the stories in the Old Testament, don't we? They cut the, they kill animals, you know? You gather together and you kill an animal and you spill the blood and everybody feels good. You know, because God's happy now we done our sacrifice and you know shake hands with George when he goes to his village I'll see you next year because I know we're going to do this again we're going to be back here again we're on that cycle and we know we're in the new covenant we know that Jesus died for us but how many of you also know that many of us we've got our own sacrifices you know two days without committing that sin 
and I feel like, okay, now I can come before God because I feel good, you know. Prayer can be done for the right reasons, can be done for the wrong reasons. It can be another sacrifice. All the religious practices can be sacrifices that we need to do so our conscience feels good. Then we can come before God. That is a tiring way to live your Christian life. It's a tiring way to live your Christian life. You will spiritually burn out at some point if that's you. And if the Lord's speaking to you this morning, maybe he's saying to you, you know, today's the day for you. Stop it. Just stop it. Accept, as Gary said, accept that robe of righteousness. Accept that there is nothing you can do, have done, will ever be able to do. You will never make yourself right before God. You can't do it. If the Lord's speaking to you this morning, I just want to encourage you, don't walk away from a moment when the Spirit's speaking to you. Respond to the Holy Spirit. Amen going to get these guys to just sing uh, again lead us in a song we're going to hang up the front here if you would like prayer come forward uh if you want to head next door grab some tea and coffee uh feel free to do that the kettle's on and so on can i just ask if you stay in the auditorium just respect the space and what god is doing up the front here with with people let me just pray for us then we're going to move on so father thank you lord for this morning thank you for your word that has come to us today god thank you father Lord, thank you that it's the gospel message. It's that message that Gary spoke that begins revivals. It's that message that sets nations on new courses. It's that message that sets hearts and individual lives on new courses, Father. And we thank you for that powerful message this morning, Lord. Now I pray, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, don't let anybody walk away this morning that shouldn't walk away without first doing business with you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.